Jokey on the track. Recording in progress. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dudes and dudettes, the sexy and the not so sexy, big children and little, welcome. These aren't episodes, uh, these are adventures. I'm the novelist, author, poet, Lamont Anthony Wright, aka Graffiti Blue. Uh, poet on my left. I guess on my right on here. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself and telling the people who you are? <laughs> I, I go by the name of Mr. Enlightenment, the Kilowatt Poet. That's what's up. How did you get your name? Well, I'm an elementary school teacher. So when I was kind of going through the, what should I write under? Should I go by my real name? Should I go by the pen name? I was just bouncing ideas and Mr. Enlightenment, that's kind of what I do. Like giving information to people all day okay and kind of the whole social media light was uh thinking about when you get an idea called light bulb moment that's that. okay that's what's up that's what's up um it seems like it seems to me that it seems to me that speaking in front of people as a teacher and being a poet or a spoken word artist is kind of one and the same. Would you agree with that? Yeah, um, well, with elementary school kids or just kids in general, you aren't always picking your topics. You know, when I write my poetry, that's kind of what I want to write about. So I'm kind of trying to get their attention, trying to get them to buy in. I'm giving them a specific set of skills but still, yeah, you're in front of people who at some point may not want to pay attention, but you kind of find a way to get them engaged. Right. Okay. I'm not trying to hold my audience hostage, but I can kind of, I can kind of uh, use some motivation tactics for my kids. Okay. I'm not necessarily going to uh, take my, my listeners' recess if they're not tuning men to a poem, but hopefully they'll be you know, likely to listen because of what I'm saying. Indeed, um, it has been it has been my observation that um, holding people's attention with words is maybe one of the most difficult things you can do. You can compete with like, I mean, children are another set of, is another animal entirely. What what are the age ranges of the children you teach? Nine and ten. Okay. Oh, actually, nine to eleven, depending on how they when their birthday falls. Okay, gotcha. Like some, in my experience, some adults can be like trying to get a, the attention of a child, especially if you're performing in a place that serves a lot of alcohol. So you're competing with the alcohol, or a uh, place might be a little uh, ratchet, for the lack of a better word, depending on where you're at. You know what I mean? So you have to deal with these loud talking voices or whatever and whatever. Have you have you had any challenging situations like that where you were competing for these for your audience's attention? Yeah, especially where I'm at in Charleston, like it's not the biggest poetry scene. Okay. And so the venues that people, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to make money off the art, especially when you're hosting events. So what I realized around here. You have to package the event like a party. Mm. So after the poetry, there's going to be a DJ. There's going to be, first of all, like, I'm not saying only women, but women kind of 
our major audience for the poetry art scene around here. Okay. So you put together an event, like a poetry event, and a, let's say a guy who has no interest in the poetry, but he knows that the, the audience, you know, is going to be a good amount of women there. So he comes or they come, you know, while the poetry is uh, going on, they're in the back talking, you know, maybe trying to meet some people. So you kind of, you're dealing with people who are still having their own conversation, but when you say something in front of them, you know, they might, a line might make them stop talking or look up right. and say, oh, what did he say? Like, what's going on with right, him? Right, right, what's right, going right. on with her? So you do have to deal with the venues where, let's say, I didn't even know this poetry event was going on. I just came for a drink. And I just happened to see that there's a poetry event going on. So you got to deal with that. Or there's pool tables in the back. So sometimes they're like, you know, we're going to take the pool table, we're going to take the pool stick, pool cue away until the poetry is over. So a lot of these are bars where they're having these poetry events. So, you know, I'm not going to turn down some money as far as the owner or promoter. You know, I came out here to drink, came out here to food. I'm still trying to have this poetry event. So you do have to, uh, deal with people who are not really interested in what you're having to say. Or maybe they came for a certain poet and they don't know who you are. You're not the headliner. You're from out of town. So right. Like, then there's that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's right. like, oh, I, I know this, like maybe I'm a poetry person that comes to the events. I came, I got my favorites. You know, every, every venue has their regulars. You know, who's this guy showing up? You know, what is he talking about? They might not be paying too much attention to you. But then when you get on the mic and start saying something like, oh, okay, I want to hear a little bit more. Okay. Now, the next episode of The Adventures of a Naive Poet, I'm talking about hood fame, okay? And uh, and how much that kind of factors in to the poetry scene. You know what I mean? The art like... Um, guys might not necessarily be a Maya Angelou or some of these guys in the top, you know, the top poets or whatever in the country, but in their neighborhood, they are famous. Would you consider yourself hood famous in Charleston? I wouldn't say hood famous, but if you, it's almost like, if it was a sports reference, I'm okay. not an all-star, Okay. but I am a, I, I got decent numbers. Let's say that. <laughs> I got decent numbers. Oh, so if you no, know no, the no. game. Right, 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 right. If you know right, the right. game, if you know the game, you like you recognize who got skills and don't. But to the average person, like, oh, I never heard of you though. Right. I right, heard of this okay. person, I never heard of you. Right. But then when you come to the game, oh, this guy can play or she can play. You know, I recognize skill when I see it, even though I might not know you. But if you're a poet in Charleston and you've been doing it for a while. You you probably heard of my name. Okay, that's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah, I have this whole thing, and I really want to talk. I really wanted to talk about hood fame and how that kind of factors in to some of the the, the, the politics. Again, what I was telling you off camera was that um, was that I felt a way when I was listening to a poet um, on on one of the blogs. I'm very active on the blogs. And this gentleman was just talking about, man, you know, what is the black agenda? Or is there even a black agenda at all? Which got me thinking, I'm like, is there a black agenda? And if there is, what should it be? And I'm just like, okay, uh, unity should be on that agenda, which then led me to a line of thinking that was like, well, then how do we get together? How do we get together? We have conversations like the ones you and me are having right now. Okay, well, what do we talk about? Well. And as a man who believes in a power higher than himself, I was always, through that understanding of that which we call God, I understand that we're supposed to testify our truth. I'm not necessarily supposed to tell you how to live, Kilowatt, or tell whoever's watching how to live. All I can say is, this is my truth, this is my journey, this is what I learned, okay? So to do that, I figured to be transparent. So in in the, in the in the name of transparency, um, do you have any stories or kind of coming of age 
adventures that you went through in your route to becoming a poet? And then what did you then what did you kind of learn? What what did you kind of think before you took that journey? And then what did you learn after you took that journey? Does that make sense? Well, it's just um, overcoming the nerves the first time. Okay. And when I went from being somebody who who wrote for myself, okay. You know, I wrote in a college class. That's kind of that's kind of the beginning of my poetry, as far as like uh, traditional poem. More like I grew up a hip hop fan, so I wrote raps here and there. Right. But I took a college class where we had to put together a por por portfolio of poems. So that actually ended up becoming a lot of my first collection was some of those poems that I put together in my college course. And just becoming a person who was sharing poetry on social media to somebody that got enough confidence to get on stage and do it. And then I realized after I went to poetry open mics over the years, I was like, the best poets I realized weren't reading off the paper. So I went from paper, not being able to engage with the fans, not saying that there's a lot of poets who are good when reading from the page. It depends on what the uh, event is. So if it's like a poetry reading, I still incorporate some reading from the paper and just from memory. But I realized that my best delivery was when I memorized the poem. Mm, so okay. that became a goal of mine. Like one of, that's one of the most difficult things for me. Really? And I just had to make myself like it's almost going back to the study. Right, 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 right. No, that's that's real. That's real. Yeah. yeah. And also, it was like when people hear you a poem, it's like, oh, let me hear something. Right. I'm like, that. Like you always got to keep a poem in your. You got to keep a keep a couple poems ready because somebody yeah. like, hey, what do you do? Oh, you write poetry? Let me hear something. If you so, stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Yeah, yeah. Right. I started, I already got a couple poems locked in every time. So if you ask me for one, I'm going to drop one for you. Okay. And then when I, go to the, when I go to the venue, I want to get that good impression. Or if it's the first time in front of an audience, you know, like this poem is one of my you know, my favorites. So I you know, I make sure I can say a couple from memory. Okay. Or if I'm doing a, a feature, I want to do... I, it's my goal to do the poem from memory. So I went, I had that journey. You know, I still like to write. And, and people, I don't say people, reading is not the priority anymore. Okay, people right, okay. Put, people still put poetry books together, but I realized people like hearing it. People like hearing the poetry. People so that's love, what got me, yeah. That's what got me into recording it. So I got a couple poetry albums, poetry spoken word albums that shameless plug that people can check out on. It ain't, it ain't nothing uh, shameless. I ain't nothing shameless here. I will be putting up all every album that you got, man, on the on the promo for this. So please, ain't no plug. Yeah, we, so, we are here to help each other. It's not all about the series, man. It is about it is about what you got going on. I got a catalog too, and I make sure people know that catalog exists. Ain't nothing wrong with it, man. How many albums do you got? I got two, and then I dropped a single like last month. So okay. I got two full albums, and then I got one like single that okay. I just dropped. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yeah. Do, you, do you like recording with music in the background? Yeah, that's what every every one on my album is music. I like the music behind it. Now I remember you and I. This isn't our first collab, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Kilowatt and I. Uh, I had collabed before and you had sent me some music that was pretty freaking dope. I can definitely tell there's a hip hop influence, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah, and, cool. and what you're doing, man, you, do you have a favorite hip hop artist or a group of artists? Uh, who are some favorite. of your favorites? Jay-Z is my favorite. So okay. I, grew, I grew up in South Carolina, but I was heavy influenced with New York rap. Okay. And I was a student of the game, basically. You know, back when the Source magazine, like that was my go-to. When so I read yes. the Source, I read the Source, and then they'll give the ratings of the albums. Or I was like, all right, 
three mics, three and a half mics, four mics, four and a half. I was like, if you gave me three mics, I would check you out. Okay. And I saw all Rap City, the basement, <laughs> Big Digger, and all them, Joe Claire, people in the booth, hearing them rapping, freestyle. I mean, I, I grew up on that. So, and I thought poetry was a way to stay. You can, you can you can be a poet. Like nobody looks crazy. Nobody looks at you crazy for saying I'm 35 and I'm a poet. Right. You're 35 trying to get in the rap game. They look at you kind of crazy. Yeah. You know, unless, you, unless you've been already in the game. For right. <laughs> They're like you know I can say like hey I'm a poet. Oh cool. What you what do you perform at? I was like I'm I'm 40 years old. Like hey I'm a, I'm a rapper. I'm an up and coming rapper. It's like they ain't really checking for me right now. Mm -mm. No, not at all, no. Um, the funny thing about uh, rap to me is is exactly what you said. They'll give you a respectable pass if you're 55, but you was rapping since you was 15 and you maintain a high level. But if you, like you said, they're just trying to crack, crack into the rap game at 38, you know what I mean? And you just start and everybody's like, get out of here. Um, whereas, whereas in poetry, hell, if you're 100 years old, people will go listen to you speak as a, as a poet and they wouldn't even freaking blink an eye. That's just, that's just what it is. And there's a certain maturity attached to poetry that is not necessarily attached to rap. And I believe that is in, in a great part too um the every the, the the popularized rap is a young man's game you know what i mean and yeah. it's supposed to be the the youth is supposed to have a voice without any question at the same time unlike the best and like unlike the nba or any sports where your mind actually gets sharper supposedly as we get older you know what i mean and your vocabulary broadens and your life experience broadens one would say if you kept your rap skill up like a black thought that you would be one of the nastiest lyricists ever because now you have 30 years of experience on the mic and you've got all of these life experiences that you can share you know what i mean which makes a jay-z so freaking potent now because he's seen so much on both sides of the game my opinion are there anything is there anything about poetry that you thought about poetry before you got into it and you were completely wrong about it after you got into it? Did you have any, there's a segment on, on the show called Naive Notions. So right now I'm fishing to see if you had any naive notions about your current craft. Are there any naive notions? I always thought that's another, another thing that I kind of deal with to the average listener average person when you are telling them about a poetry you know you're a poet you write poetry people kind of off already have an opinion of it based on the poetry we had to read growing up right like the shakespeare and stuff like that it's like you read that poetry and you still don't understand what's going on you need like a translator mm -hmm. so and people still feel that way like oh yeah i just don't get it you know that's why i hear a lot of people say you know, I, I made sure that coming from that hip hop background, I wrote so you would relate to it. Even if there's a deeper meaning, you can get something on the surface, but they could also be a deeper meaning too. So I never want to write a poem where you'd be like, what's going on here? Like, what are you talking about? Even though it might, you might get a totally different interpretation than I had but that's the one of the beautiful things about poetry. Five people can read the same poem and they can get something different from it. That is a fact. Kilowatt, I appreciate you, brother. Mr. Enlightenment, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for that. Here we go again. Now, um, you have a very unique style. 
you know what I mean? And and you slide a lot of bars in between bars, you know what I mean? I love that type of stuff because I love going back and rewinding. I'm like, hold on, what did he say? You know what I mean? I love going back. I, I'm, I'm a big one for wordplay, especially when wordplay makes sense. You follow what I'm saying? So, so, so I'm a cat. And I say this respectfully because everything ain't for everybody. I'm just talking about my personal preference. You follow what I'm saying? So if there are poets out there that did put words together for the sake of putting words together, I'm not I'm not striking them because at one time I was super young and I didn't have a lot of experience. So I would just I was just so good at putting words together. Didn't didn't need to make narrative sense. I was just putting them together. You know what I mean? But after you get a silver whisker or two, you know what I mean? Or close to it, maybe. Or if you just got an old soul, you know what I mean? And, and, and you can put your words together along with a really, really good story. Oh, that's my shit. Or if you really saying something powerful. So are there some bars you would like to share, Mr. Enlightenment? Yeah, yeah, I'm down for uh, some little, little sharing. Of <laughs> All right, the, the, the floor is yours. I'm going to be sipping tea watching. All right, so I'm trying to think of what poem I want to go with. I think I'm going to go with this one called uh, My Girl. It's got some nice wordplay in there. Okay, that's what's up. So every time I start a poem, I say lights on, and then when I end it, it's lights out. Okay. All right, so lights on. When I'm around you, babe, my self-control is a 4-3 defense, and my heart is calling Kaepernick. Good luck slowing it down. Like the 49s that travel west, I found my goal. Too valuable to spend, so I keep you in my pocket. Even the scent of your perfume puts me on cloud nine. I'm talking up in the cloud with Snoop, Bob, Marley, and Wiz Khalifa. When I look into your eyes, I see our future. Matter of fact, you're my brown-eyed time machine. Time stands still when we in the Matrix. I'm popping blue and red pills, trying to capture that feeling when we first met. I know you remember that night, gazing into each other's eyes, passing love notes. You made me wish I had amnesia, so I wouldn't be able to remember what life was like without you. Even if I had an argument with the great David Ruffin, I still wouldn't fight the temptation. Excuse <laughs> my girl. Like so. <laughs> nice. I, I, I just saw David Ruffin on a documentary called, um, gosh, it was called Soul Something. Apparently, in 1969, in Harlem, New York, there was this big freaking concert that had 300,000 black people. Apparently the same time this is going on, Woodstock is going on. Oh, and yeah, put, yeah. So I saw that documentary. And they put, did it, right? Yes, yes. And they're putting, and they're putting the man on the moon. So I'm like, dude, I was born in 1969 in New York. And maybe my mother was pregnant with me that summer. But I, but I was born later in December. So I'm like, how did I live all of this life and not know that this concert with 300,000 brothers and sisters, beautiful, existed? Freaking Nina Simone is there. Freaking David Ruffin is freaking there. A 19-year-old Stevie Wonder is there. Okay? Yeah. Freaking... Um, Mahalia Jackson is there. It, it is insane. Gladys Knight, the Pips is there. Gladys Knight looked like she was 19. It was amazing. So I was just like, again, it, it just goes to show you how important infrastructure is. You know what I'm saying? You had, this, you had these beautiful Black people doing something groundbreaking. And the history tellers buried it, and you would not even know this even happened. You follow what I'm saying? You know, freak, I, I was there almost, you know what I mean? And I, I, this is the first I heard of this. That's crazy. You understand what I'm saying? That's why it's important. When I'm in the back room with poets like yourself, you know what I mean? I'm like, why does nobody have the camera on? Why are we not documenting our own history? That's why I'm getting on here. That's why I started this series, Killer, is because 
Who's going to tell your story, bro? Who's going to tell my story? We are in charge. We have to tell our stories or else it gets lost. And then you let them tell the story. And we know how they tell a story. They'll tell a story like you don't even belong here, like you're less than, like you're like you're a criminal or an outlaw. Or I remember when I was in high school, Cass was like, oh, we saved you. If we didn't come and save you, you would have still been in the African bush. I'm just like, huh? Not knowing there were beautiful African cities. Crazy shit. Crazy. You know what yeah. I mean? And that's what I'm saying. I'm like, if we don't, the hell with everybody else. My small part, my small contribution could be that tiny is to get us together and have these conversations and make it commonplace. You know what I mean? It's crazy. But yeah, we're just watching, uh, just watching. It was a beautiful documentary. It's freaking amazing. I'm going to have to watch it five times just because I was floored. Freaking Stevie Wonder was spazzing out, playing the drums. I did hear about it. Yep. Playing the drums. I didn't watch all drums. of it, but I definitely I saw I saw the beginning of it, and I heard about you know he was giving a background about this, and you know how hard it would be to get that many artists together like that. Again, it would probably be impossible. Hey. Stevie was nineteen, bro. Stevie and Nina. First of all, Nina Simone would have been enough. You know what I mean? That that was just insane. But everybody else, after, you know, before, after that, it was crazy. That Sly and the Family Stone was on there. Kill. It was it was a, it was a, absolutely amazing. Anyhow, you know, um, some of my naive notions. Speaking of that, is just being just being black. Period. Um, when I was coming up, killer, I noticed that in my neighborhood that the people who own things did not look like the people who were buying everything. Okay. You know, the Italians owned all the pizza shops. Some of the, some of my middle Eastern Muslim brothers, you know what I mean? Owned a lot of the other stores selling alcohol or whatever else. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, the Chinese owned all the restaurants, the Chinese restaurants. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just like, why don't we own anything in our neighborhood? So in my head, I'm just like, man, is there something with this skin that's wrong? Or why, why don't we have ownership? And then it wouldn't be until later on in life that I realized that the game was necessarily was rigged in many respects, you know what I mean, to where it was set up, you know what I mean, to divide and conquer. It was set up, there was actual legislation that was in place, so you could not necessarily look like you or look like me and own property in your neighborhood that was housing a business. I didn't even know that, but, you know, you, you freaking see to, you know, a lot of times we, seeing is believing for many people, you know what I mean? So it's just like, if we, if we never see ourselves in positions of ownership, then we get lines like the one Biggie Small set where, you know, you either sell and crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot, you know what I mean? Because that's what we see, you know what I mean? So in any event, you know, um, any, any, any naive notions you had about your skin color? I just didn't realize, like I went to a predominantly white college. So I didn't realize, you know, I'm just going about being myself. Okay. I was kind of naive about how people would perceive me because this is early 2000s when I'm in college. Okay. So, I was growing my hair out, sometimes walking around, big afro, cornrows, right, right, right. baggy jeans, jerseys. I was naive about like, you know, we, we as a, a younger people, we don't we don't um, realize like, you know, you got to kind of put your best foot forward. So mm. I don't know how the professor perceived me or some of my classmates perceived me that didn't know me. 
Now, once you get to know me, it's like, oh, he's a cool guy, no harm. But to the average person, big guy, cornrows, uh, long necklace, like just stereotypical stuff. I just didn't think about that when I was you know, 19, 20, 21. Now, you know, you kind of think about how others are perceiving you with the way you dress and how you present yourself. Okay, right. So right. yeah, especially because I'm like I'm in a predominantly white school. Now, if I went to a HBCU, that wouldn't have been too strange because that's kind of how everybody in my age group was dressing at that time. But then I kind of went through a little culture shock, like different styles of dress. Like to them, that might be you know a little uh, of a threat. Mm, right, right, right. It's sort of like and. and and funny you should say that because the level of that level of respect, I want to say slash ignorance was was very evident during kind of the Trayvon Martin trial. You know what I mean? When 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 uh, I forget the guy who shot Trayvon, I forget his name. Zimmerman. Not that I want to remember Zimmerman. his name. Zimmerman. Um, Zimmerman. Freaking Zimmerman. When Zimmerman was like, you know, this this kid is in this hoodie. You know what I mean? I'm just like, I'm just like, really? You know, um, and there was a, a section of certain people of all colors that was almost fearful about wearing a sweat hoodie. I'm like, that is not a sweat hoodie is not the gangster's uniform. It's just not. It's not the uniform. Of gang- yes. It, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not saying thugs don't wear hoodies, you know what I mean? But so do people who jog, you know what I mean? (laughs) You know, so do people who play ball. So do people who play tennis, you know what I mean? So do people who go to the gym and work out. I'm just like, well, we can't. We Everybody that has a hood over their head, maybe it's cold. Maybe you rocking a baldy like me. You know what I mean? For sure. Like, every day I'm telling somebody at my school to, take their hoodie off like white kids black kids doesn't matter like that age group they love hoodies and they wear them and it's warm too which is strange to me like it's 80 degrees out they got a hoodie on right right y'all right. don't get y'all don't get hot so they like wearing shorts and hoodies regardless of the weather right you know what i mean and 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 you know and the fashion is the fashion you know what i mean um somebody asked me why do new yorkers wear Timberlands so much. Oh yeah, yeah, all year <laughs> round. All year round, even if it's hot. I'm like, have you ever walked on a New York City street? You know what I mean? I'm like, New York City streets are are, are pretty rough. It's the they call it the concrete jungle for real. You know what I mean? And is it can be dangerous to just have your toes out in New York City, depending on where you grew up. You know what I mean? steel toe boots are 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 the right choice <laughs> you know what I mean in many aspects of there you know what I mean but at the same time that's what it is because I know brothers that wore wore Timberland to the beach so that is what it is yep, yep. it doesn't, hey, doesn't, doesn't now shorts right right now just because thugs wear Tim's and kids might wear Tim's to the beach just because that's that's how that's how they do it doesn't mean we should hold a freaking pistol up or or be scared or whatever, whatever, whatever. So yeah, that freaking kind of that kind of drove me nuts. But it is, but it is what it is. Um, do you do you have do you have any do you have any other bars for us? Do you have that you would like to that you would like to share? I can do this one. Like this is my introduction poem. This is when I usually. I usually kick off the set with this one. Okay, okay. That's what's up. This one's called Let There Be Light. All right. Light song. I remember when mom used to call me home before the street lights came on. Now I feel at home on stage when the lights are on. Senior year undergrad, that's when the light came on. Time to illuminate. I write like I'm afraid of the dark. My pen is a light bulb, a match waiting for that spark. When I start to shine, I don't plan on flickering. My brain is a generator, ready to kick in like an NFL punter. 
try to take my shine. I got enough radiance to go around. I'll even pass it out like free samples. Like the first attempts of Neanderthals trying to create fire, you probably fizz out before you replicate me. When someone closes the gap, it's time to increase the voltage, become more ultraviolet. For every sunrise, there's a sunset, but not if I can help it. Prepare for my summer solstice. Let there be light. Lights out. Nice. Let me go back to that line. For every sunrise, there's a sunset, but not if I can help it. Is that, is that, is that, I'm assuming that's a play on the light and the light will always be on as far as you, as far as you're concerned. And and just through just research and stuff, the summer solstice is the day that the light shines the longest. Uh, Well done, poet. Well done. When, when, okay, there's a, there's a part that I experienced. You let me know if it's the same for you. There's a part as a poet that I experience where I'm not trying to say like we've arrived or that you're content, but there was that one performance that I was just like, I can really do this. You know what I'm saying? Did you, did you have that? Did you have that come to Jesus moment after, after a performance at one point? It was early on that I got a lot of good crowd reaction. And it's crazy that I retired that poem after that because I didn't want to be like, that was a crutch because it was an erotic poetry night and I'm not, that's not my forte. Okay. But I decided to take my crack at writing an erotic poem. But like me, I had to be creative with it. Okay. So when I read that poem, it got a lot of love. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my friends that came out there for that event you know, they would want me to read that one. They want me to hear that one. So I kind of I kind of retired that poem to this day. Like, it's been a long time since I even did that poem. Right. Actually, I'm thinking about bringing it back. Okay. It's a little more raunchy than my normal style. <laughs> right, but right. I feel like it's, it's good enough that even if you're not one of the, you know, erotic fans, I did it enough where it's not just like, that's another problem that I have with some, erotic nights it's not i feel like it's a crutch as a poet there's certain things you can write about as a poet and get love right so i try to stay away from those things when i was going out different uh poetry events you know bashing men or bashing women that's gonna get a lot of love yes yes sex is gonna get a lot of love right and a lot of times the sex poem not even that creative it's just like some soft porn like right. just telling the girl what I want to do to you or how I'm going to do it to you. It's like, I got to weave in the creativity. Right. So when I do, when I do talk about some erotic poetry, I got to make it creative. Like, and it's kind of redundant to me. Like I write, I'd rather hear a variety of poets instead of like a whole night of sex poems. I'm the, I am the same way. Sometimes like in an open mic setting, right? And I love doing this. I, I love going to some place where I don't have the so-called hood fame we talked about earlier, you know what I mean? And go and go somewhere and they're not really known. And, and let's say five poets go before you, right? Whatever they're talking about, I like to go left of what they're talking about. So the sex poem is dope is doper to me when it comes out of nowhere and it, and and it's creative and it and it and it fits a larger narrative not necessarily i'm going to rock your world or this is how i rocked your world or this is how i'm going to rock your world should you ever give it to me but it just it there's something creatively going on it is a means to an end somewhere you follow what i'm saying i'm the exact same way so I've gone to uh, erotic nights. I've written in a, a whole erotic feature. My first novel was an erotic novel, so I'm not bashing it. But but even in that story, there was a there was a bigger picture. Indeed, what is your favorite type of poem to write? Now that we're there, do you have a a favorite type? Are you would you consider yourself like? You, you really find your zone when you're writing like revolution or storytelling or what is what would you say is your 
is your bag? Like right now, I've been doing a lot of like, so back to what I started as a social media poet. Okay. When Twitter was coming out, it was only like the what, 130 characters or whatever. Mm -hmm. 100, 140, yes, sir. 140 characters. So I had to, like, I was dabbling in the haiku, and then I came up with, I heard about what's called micro poetry. So that's what I was really making my, my goal was to, to write poems that would fit on a Twitter post. Okay. Plus, it worked because, you know, people didn't have to scroll. They didn't have to read a lot. You kind of real quick, hit them with a quick, quick concept, try to be clever in that short amount of time. Right, so that's right. what I started doing. So I wrote a lot of poems like that recently. Matter of fact, yeah. the last few years, I just got a Word document of probably like, probably 200 of those poems. That's what I post on Instagram. Yeah, dude. I, and right, well, I like the transition from Twitter to Instagram. And now that you jog my memory, you would have these really dope short joints and I started retweeting them all the time because <laughs> it just was fire, you know what I mean. And then we, then then I then I kind of knew you through there, and then it, then through uh, the other social media spaces. I forgot what our collab was. I think I was working for Culture Zine Media at the time. Yeah, I called in. Your yeah, show. you called, called in. in. Yeah, you called in, and we did. And we did it and we did that show and that was freaking that was freaking dope. That was years ago. You have been writing for a long time in the digital space, my brother. Yeah, so that's kind of what I started writing right around that time when social media became a thing is right. when I started with my writing. And what kind of led me to I just went into creative mode is a breakup. So right around when I got out of college, maybe a couple of years after, I had that portfolio of poems just kind of sitting there. And the breakup like sparked my writing again. Oh. So that's what made me really get into it. And I was posting my poems on MySpace when that was a thing. They had a little con a little note section. And then I would post them when Facebook had a note section. Mm -hmm. I started posting it, getting good feedback. Then I was like, all right, somebody else kind of, Hey, like, hey, you ever thought about putting these together? Because you're getting a lot of feedback on it. You ever thought about putting your poems together in a chat book? Right. So I was like, yeah, let me go ahead and go ahead and do that. So that's kind of how my first project came around. Okay, so would you consider, okay, so back to the question, would you consider yourself a romance poet? Relationship, relationships are like one of the, even though I'm not a relationship expert, actually I'm pretty pretty uh, bad at relationships, I'll say. <laughs> I was like, my, my resume of relationships is uh, <laughs> probably like a C minus or something. Right, right, right. But, no, uh, no, no. Many, many, uh, it, uh, through the years, man, you definitely have a lot to say about romance. You've, you've, you've not saying that you haven't touched on other areas, you know what I mean? Revolutionary, black this, black that, whatever, whatever, whatever. But uh, a lot of times when you raise my eyebrow, which is often, is definitely you are speaking on some love, let live, love loss type deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so I haven't experienced all of that, but just from, you know, just hearing about relationships from other people, seeing it play out in the media with celebrities, you know, I just get those ideas of how women feel about be being treated this way, by how men will be treated this way. So... I kind of go on both sides of it. Like I'm not trying to bash either side, but you know, it's a clever way of saying this, clever way of saying that. Yeah. You know, what are the relationship issues that come up with people? He's kind of putting it in a clever way and at the same time make it short where you don't have to scroll. Like mm, I right. follow a lot of poets and I don't the, the longer poems kind of like, oh, I'm just scrolling for a little while. Like, I don't, I'm not in the mood to read the long one, but I feel like Right. I'll read you a short one. Right. So that's how a lot of people are. Like, they're scrolling. You got to catch that attention when they're scrolling. Yeah, especially, especially today, there's just so much freaking content coming into that device, your tablet, your computer, your phone. You know what I mean? And there is a lot to contend with. You know what I mean? So 
you know, you're competing for maybe 15 seconds of somebody's attention. You know what I mean? So I definitely, definitely get it. Um, when I when I try to express like, you know, even when it came to comes to this podcast, I'm just like, we could just we could rap. You know what I mean? Because I always want the conversation to be organic, but I don't necessarily want to to give somebody more than they could more than they could chew in one sitting. So depending on how it goes, it might be a part two, might be a part three. All of that stuff, all of that stuff is all love. You know what I mean? So what I like about about the bite sized capsule, it it actually forces you, the artist to be way more clever because you got to say what you got to say. You have to kind of make your point in 140 characters or less, you know what I mean? So it just is like, so the, so there's, there's almost no buildup. It went on a long poem. I love my long poems too. You know what I mean? On a long poem, I could, I could, I could set it up. You know what I mean? I could set up, I could wind it up like Ali or Sugar Ray for this freaking knockout punch but i don't have that kind of time for a short one so i gotta freaking hit you with the bruce lee short freaking one inch punch really really freaking quick you know what i mean do you have a do you have an example of when it didn't go so well you know what i mean on on a night was it maybe early yeah, in there's your plenty career? of times where I, I always feel you're always your worst critic but i feel like Somebody who had a sub a subpar poem got more of a reaction than me. And mm -hmm. I was like, I always scratched my head at the end of the night. I was like, I you okay. know, I appreciate everybody getting up there and doing it, but you can say, like, this poem wasn't that great. I'm not saying <laughs> mine was, but why is this person getting all the love? It's almost like that home field advantage. Like you the home, you got the home cooking, like you're the crowd favorite. So they love whatever you say. Talk about it. Talk about I it. I feel like my stuff was always, I feel like I get love from the poets, the people that write, the people that appreciate the wordplay. I'll get somebody to come up to me at the end of the night and say, yo, I appreciate, I like that line. When somebody come up here and tell you, like, I remember that line you said, like, that's a big thing. But that's sometimes I get up deal. and it's like, I finished my poem with like some golf claps. And then some other person might have got like standing ovation. So I'm like, that, right. <laughs> hey, well, remember when Erica Badu said, "I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shh," right? Yes, for sure. Yeah, I get it. You, I, I have done that. You know what I mean? And somebody's got home field advantage, and you go up there and you put on what you feel is a lyrical clinic. You know what I mean? You're you're all over the place. You're expressive. You you don't you don't even stumble. You don't even miss a step. You you're kind of you're in the moment of the poem. You finish after expressing all this emotion, and people are just like, so you can barely hear it. Then Johnny gets up there, or Sarah. You know what I mean? Sarah's got her whole all of her people out there. You know what I mean? And Sarah's like, roses are red, yeah. violets are blue, graffiti blue sucks, <laughs> and kilowatt does too. And yeah. they will and they will yeah, flip dude. the table like oh my god, that's the greatest poem I ever heard. And yeah, I want to stop. Wild, like. <laughs> so so I feel you. Um what do you do? What is your next performance like after you experience a night like that? What, what do you do? I used to have a lot of vengeance energy. I, I am rehabilitated. I sat on the couch. I talked to Jesus. I'm not big on revenge now. Not big, but I still am sort of vengeful. What is your preparation like after a night like that? Are you going in like... I'm really gonna freaking smoke this mic next time, or do you never go to that type of venue again? Yeah, I've been kind of staying away from certain venues that I think are geared more to the flashy poet. Mm. I feel like, like I told you about how the venues are set up around my area. 
Mm-hmm. I've been steering myself towards the, this is just a poetry event. There's no party. There's no DJ. Mm-hmm. If you came here, you know that you can get a, a drink and you're going to hear some poetry. That's it. So right. when you got that premise, you're going to get the strictly poetry enthusiast. People are interested in the word. You're going to get the better listeners. So I'm going to steer myself towards those. But occasionally, you know, you do feel like, all right, I need to, I need to write something else, or I need to pick a different poem for this type of crowd. So, yeah, you feel like, all right, I got to do better. I want to get a better reaction next time. I got to dig in the crates for some other poem that might work. Right. Or I just, you know, keep going. Because maybe people were feeling it. They just, you need to hear it more. Or you need to and, go and, more. And, 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 there, and, and it's funny sometimes, right? Like, sometimes I'll write a poem and I'm like, man, this is really going to, this is going to kill. And then I take that poem to this place, right? The first place. And it might not do as good as I thought it did. Or then I take that same poem down the street and the poem really freaking does like super well. And it always trips me out how the same poem, people will react in different spaces. Like in this place, some people caught the first line. In this place, some people caught the third line. In this place, you know what I mean? Some people like the last line. It always it always bugs me out. Do you, are, are you... Would you consider yourself a poet that is in tune with the audience, or, or are you are you are you kind of with them? And do you see do you, you see their reactions? I would imagine you, you see everything at this point. You've been doing it long enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes I try to read the crowd, but then sometimes I go like, "This has been historically a good poem for whatever crowd." Okay. Just because I've been doing the poem enough in different places. This poem right here usually works. And then I'll try another one. I kind of like, I got a, you know, four or five poems that I have in my head at a different time to perform. So I'll hit them usually with the one or two I know that hit. And then I'll kind of shuffle between the other one that I try. Okay. What was your, out of all the shows you've done, do you have that one standout show in your mind, to your memory? Yeah, so I put on, I started putting on my own show just because I struggled with getting features. Okay. And I didn't go out enough to try to get, you know, I never became the crowd favorite enough for somebody to say, we want you to do a feature for us. Okay. So I started organizing my own event and I'm going to feature myself. So I did that. I'm and in the same together. Man. It was like just me. I talked to the venue. I was like, let's set it up. Let's do this. I reached out to some of my poetry friends. I set up a, a nice list of poets. And then basically I featured myself. And it was a good night. And I got a lot of um good feedback. And that's what's up. That's what's up. And interestingly enough, and I, I talked about this on on the blog on some of the blogs that I have done. And I talk and I really talk about the um not only the 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 politics of poetry but the um but the infrastructure of poetry. For example, you may have a comedian and let's say you and I instead of poetry wanted to be comedians. Well there's an infrastructure. You know you go down to LA, you go at these comedy clubs and there's kind of a built in infrastructure where you can make it or break it and your highest level, you know, you break through, you get a Netflix special, movies and so forth, right? The same thing about acting. There's there's kind of an infrastructure for acting. You could either move to Los Angeles, you could move to New York, you could do Broadway, Broadway plays, send your script out, whatever, 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 send your send your portfolio out or whatever, maybe get discovered, maybe break through in a commercial here and there or whatever. You get a break, somebody sees your face, Next thing you know, you're in a movie. Hopefully, even though it's a long shot, hopefully you're the next Tom Cruise or whoever, right? Okay. For poetry, it's a little different because there's the, the infrastructure, 
yes, there are poetry venues, there are slams, there are routes you can take, but a lot of poets have to make it happen almost, not that comedians don't have to do this or actors don't have to do this, but you have to be extra independent as a, as a poet, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Whereas in, sure, a comedian can throw his or her own event, but there are enough com comedy venues where they might not necessarily have to resort to that. And the, um, the poetry venue, you know, funny is funny. You know what I mean? Whereas a poet, depending on the audience, you could be a, a madman on that mic. They might, if they're not a savvy crowd, you know what I mean, uh, lyrically savvy, you might hit the mark, you might miss the mark completely. You know what I mean? If you're, depending on what they have in their mind, they came to see. Not yeah, saying sure. that, yeah, not saying that comedians don't bomb, but you know what I'm saying. It, it's just I feel like laughter is more universal, I think, like a joke. Like people get it, like right. the stuff that you have to let. I think like I'm not saying I mean being funny is hard. Yeah, but no, it's not easy. I don't want to. I don't want comedians to see this and think I'm trying to no, I'm trying to say that they have an easy way to go because it's no, not. It's like it's like yeah. comedy is uh, well, yes and no because you got you got our poets and then you got their poets. So mm -hmm. Dave Chappelle is one of the people that can be funny regardless where he goes. Right. And you right. got like the comic view poets. Remember comic view back in the day? Mm -hmm. Then you got the comedy central poets. Like that humor is a little bit different. Right. But if you get your demographic in front of you, funny is funny, I feel like. I agree but, with that. But uh, poetry is like people want to feel a certain thing. Like certain people, right, they, right, oh, right. that's a love story. Oh, you. You know, they get behind a woman like, oh, man, you ain't this. You ain't that. I'm doing better than you. I'm, you know, you did me wrong. Now I'm doing better than you. Like, people like that kind of theme. But if I get up there and talk about my double entendres and oh, how man. good at wordplay I am, sometimes it misses people. But wow. if you got to, like, that's what happened to me a lot of times. I'm up there, you know, I'm dropping bars, wordplay. Uh, you get it. Other poets get it. But some people, they're not. So it's almost like those uh, those rappers that say you had to, they were like the the best technical rapper ever, but to sell records, they had to dumb it down or water it down. Right, 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 so right, 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 a, right. It's like you can, you can battle somebody and you can be the, the best rapper ever, but you got, a, it's a difference between being good at, you can rap good, can you make a song? Because you could be up there rapping, rapping, rapping. Like, I get it. Ooh, oh, I want to hear that line again. But the average listener, are they going to enjoy it? So it's like you take some of the lyrics, you, you tone down the lyrics a little bit, and then give them a story. I like storytelling, too. Yeah, so some way, you got to tone down the lyrics a little bit and, and give them a little bit of a story. And I think that's kind of how you, you got to balance it. Okay. I mean, you still have in your repertoire of poems, you can take them there, but I think in your set, you got to have a little bit of a story. You know, it's kind of oh, hard to oh, put absolutely. together a set. Absolutely. 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 You got to touch on a lot of people. Indeed. At the end of the day, when it's at, at the end of the day, when you and I are gone, how, how would you, how do you, how would you like to be remembered? Where, where you, what is your ultimate level? Where are you trying to get to? What is the ultimate level? And how would you like to be remembered when it's all said and done? I always said, I want to be the, the poet at the end of the night that when you went home, I remember that guy. I remember that light bulb guy. I remember the one that was talking about lights off and lights on. I remember that line he said. I want to be, when you leave the venue, I want to be one of the poets that you remember. Nice, nice, nice. That's really, at the end of the day, that's really all I ask for. You know what I mean? And is is did I did I did I touch did I touch somebody? You follow what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, and that feedback is good. Like when somebody comes up to you and say, "Man, I appreciate that," 
or I was going through something similar, like it really like resonated with me. Because when I post something on Instagram, I had someone message me or they'll share it. And like this, it's almost like you wrote it for them. It's like, they right, 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 exactly right, right, way. right, right. And then you started realizing how powerful it is. Do you have a, do you have any moments where, where um, you were taken aback by how some, I'm sure you have, you know what I mean? But to, to your recollection, um, do you have any moments where you touch somebody with a poem that you didn't, that you didn't know that you was going to have that kind of impact? Yeah, it happened for real. Like I had a poem that was talking about how people have it, you know, like let's say you, you ever, there's people that have everything set up for them. It's like mom and dad, good job, set you up, didn't have to struggle a lot. Right. And I got a poem that is talking about a couple of different instances when people had it all lined up for them and messed it up. So wow. somebody came up to me at the end of that night and like, yeah, I, I, that was really something that kind of hit home. Wow. Okay, that's what's up. I, I, it always trips me out, and it, it always seems to come from me when I'm kind of like when I'm in that space, like, man, why? You know, trying to find the motivation to keep going. You know, what I mean, I'm like, man, why am I doing it? You know, so on and so forth. Because sometimes the game could could be very unkind, you know what I mean? And sometimes, sometimes, at least for me, I could feel like I lose my way a little bit, you know what I mean? And I want to take a break and all of this stuff. And a lot of a lot of it comes when I'm when I'm trying to refocus. You know what I mean? So those instant messages, those emails, those DMs and all that stuff, when somebody says, man, you know what I mean, I got, or maybe they leave a comment on your YouTube video. And said, man, I really needed to hear this. Thank you, brother, that and that. That really means a lot of times, a lot of people don't realize how much that means to us, especially um, because for what we do, there is such a voyeur component. Like people love to sit on the sidelines and watch you all day. You know what I mean? Whether they interact, share, comment, like, subscribe, that's a different ball game. You know what I mean? But they'll sit on the side and kind of watch. You know what I mean? They could even be feeling you. They could be feeling you a lot. But it does not necessarily mean that they are compelled to tell you that. So when somebody is moved to the point where they actually express it, that is just like, oh, my God. That is that is a fantastic feeling. You know what I mean? Do you get family support? Does your family support you, Killer? Yeah, I get it. Um, but then I also realized like family wants to hook up too. But <laughs> yeah. So right, right. Family right. like that my first, you know, when I was coming up doing the poetry, I was giving out my books to my family members and stuff, and like they tell people. So I definitely had the, the, the family support, even though it wasn't monetary, but I did right, I did right, have the support. Right, 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 you know, right. I might I might say something a little risky to my for my mom's uh taste yeah but she she made an effort to read it though mm. my mom is my best friend and my first book was erotic and my mother read it cover to cover i said what do you what do you think mom she said boy you wicked but it was good and i was like okay yeah, yeah. so fortunately i had a relationship with my mother where my mother was able to see it for what it was see the artistic value in it you know what i mean but yeah but i agree with you that um, getting that support support from your family could be could be a slippery slope, you know what I mean? And I think it is a challenge we have on a cultural level, you know what I mean? Um, to whereas in, I'm not saying, hey, if you don't like it, you don't have to rock with it. I'm not saying you should support just because, but we have a lot of people, a lot of people that rock with you and rock with a lot of the poets that I know that have never necessarily shown it monetarily. You know what I mean? And they want the hookup. I get it all the time. You know what I mean? Because I do not only poetry, but I do other things, video, video editing, filming, and whatever. And cats will hit me up with like, hey, man, I got 30 hours of footage. I need to edit it. 
And I'm like, that will probably cost you this, which is already the hookup price because I know you. You yeah. know what I mean? And I'll never hear from them again just because I just didn't do it for free. And we've really got to do better, especially if on in front of everybody, we so quick to put our money out of the compu- community, talk about Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. I'm just like, oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> we, why we don't have to be a walking billboard for them you know what I mean? And if you are a walking billboard for them, then guys like Kilowatt and a hundred other cats that I know could use a $2 Patreon pledge. So that's where I stand with that. So at the same time, you don't have to give me a number, killer, but were you ever pleasantly surprised at uh, your compensation at the end of a particular night? Yeah, actually, I did some poetry for my alma mater. Okay. And they were having some kind of, the English department, you know, they were inviting alumni back that wrote books or did poetry or some kind of arts. And I agreed to it because, like, that's a definitely an opportunity to share poems. And I was expecting some money. But the amount of money they gave me, I was like, yeah, that's cool. Mm, yeah. And they gave me, like, they put me up for the night. So I was like, all right. I get okay. to go back to where I went to school, share the poems. I sold a little bit of merch. Nice. And they put me up for the night. And the guy, I went to dinner and breakfast with the the uh, English professor. The, the, those nights like that make me realize that it's possible and it does have a value. OK, one time I was going to save this story for my next one, but I'll tell you the story now. One time um, I used to frequent this um, poetry spot called Cafe Lunas. Right. And outside of Cafe Lunas doing what poets do, you know, can the, the bunch of the poets that did the open mic. It's like one in the morning. It's a, it's a big full moon outside. And we're just sitting there, you know, puffing trees and just talking, doing what poets do, right? Okay. So one of the poets was like, well, there's no money in poetry. And he said it with such conviction, it really pissed me off. You know what I mean? And because I didn't believe that was necessarily true. And I saw the poet, poet value. I mean, I knew where he was coming from in a small sense, but I didn't really agree with him at all. You know what I mean? Do you, do you agree with that, Killer? Is there no money in poetry? I know people, I follow some poets that you got to definitely hustle. Yes. That's the only reason why I wouldn't do poetry full time is because you have to stay traveling. Like yeah. I follow some poets that you got to stay traveling. So if you don't feel like it, that's, that's, that's the money you turning down. So really? You got to put in the work. Unless you're doing big corporate events, you know, you got to hit the open mics. You got to feature or maybe you I've seen poets doing workshops for kids like uh, speaking engagements for different businesses. There is money into it. You just definitely got to hustle. I think no, that's what I, everything is. Yeah. And, yeah I mean, right, right, right. And, you know, um, I understand that it is difficult to monetize creativity you know what i'm saying to monetize creativity is is a tall mountain to climb out of the gate you know what i mean so but but for somebody to 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 say that there is no monetary value in in the in the in the arts itself in any art but in words particular because words are the most powerful are one of the most powerful ways to, for an artist to express themselves. You know what I mean? I was just ridiculous. But, but the person who said it, in my opinion, no disrespect to them, I said, I think has a very limited thing. That guy who said that is not willing to travel, like you said, is not willing to hustle, like you said. It just wants to kind of set up shop somewhere and just have the, the dough come rolling in. 
my thoughts, but it's not very real. You it's know just I mean? like if you a painter or you're a rapper or R&B singer, you're definitely going to have to do more than just post your stuff online. You're going to have to get out and have to go so with action and perform and do those. You know, definitely put the gas in the car and go like that uh, song that Lupe Fiasco had, uh, uh, Hip Hop Saved My Life. Uh, uh, it was like, hey, you broke, but you get somebody to help you out, borrow some money. Maybe you got that supportive partner. You got a family member, somebody that's uh, feel strongly about your talent. And you just got to go. You've been you've been out of town. You've been away. You've been out of town doing poetry too. Not too far. I've done stuff in the southeast. Uh, you know, I've right. done stuff in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. I haven't really branched out farther than that. Okay, but that's that's kind of what I want to do. Okay, well, we, when when I when I had rhythm and poetry going, I'm sure I asked you a time or two to come out to Cali. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't at that point. I don't think I was ready for that. But now okay. I was like, I'm. Confident enough in my craft. Now I just got to get the money together and get the okay. dates together. But okay. you know, COVID kind of shut down my because the summertime is when I kind of have a two month window where I'm not teaching. So that was my plan on the summer to okay. get out of town and do some stuff. All right, but everything well, been shut down the last couple of years. So hopefully this summer I'm definitely gonna try to get to one state that I haven't performed in. Okay. Well, truth be told. Um, the guys that I work with, as far as the collective that I work with, we have been throwing events together since I was young, young, young. You talking about 16, 17 years old. You know what I mean? And these guys I pretty much trust with my life. Um, this is the same team that we're doing the showcase together in New York City. All right. Now, I... Where I'm at in life right now, I am not necessarily interested in being the curator of another poetry venue full time. That's a lot of time. And I got a couple of novels I want to finish. You know what I mean? You know, because I was open once a week and I always wrote new material and to get talent there to pay features and showcases and have music we had music there too and all that stuff that stuff is a lot of work you know what i mean you know i'm living i was when i at the time i extended you to the invitation i was living in sacramento california right now i'm living in san francisco and san francisco definitely you know with covid hopefully going away um is definitely a a cultural center that appreciates the arts. Not saying that Sacramento wasn't, okay? Sacramento, got a lot of love for Sacramento, but San Francisco, just a different animal, right? So as it stands, how I feel today, we will probably throw anywhere from one to two events a year. I will keep you posted, you know what I mean? As to when those events are, might be in New York, might be in San Francisco, might be somewhere else. You know what I mean? Because, because the network of artists we have is pretty vast. You know what I mean? And I'll let you know. And it'll be in the summertime. So if you want to come out, you know what I mean? That, that would be fantastic. Maybe we can start having the soft discussions, you know what I mean? Be it later on this year or early next year on exactly what you want to do because I would love I would love for your debut in either New York or California to, to be with us. You follow what I'm saying? I have a feeling I, I'm, I'm relatively familiar with how you get down, how you give it up. I love wordplay too. The audiences that we're getting together would appreciate wordplay the audiences that we talk about, you know, they'll put their head down and they'll just listen. You, you know, I perform with my arms and all that. And I'm sometimes I can be over the top with the expression. You know what I mean? I'm almost Buster Rhymes, <laughs> depending, you know what I mean, on your on 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 
the comparison as far as expressiveness, but the, the cats that really fuck with me will put their head down and they won't even look at all that. They want to hear what you're saying. You know what I mean? You know, and I, and I dig that and I know they would appreciate you. So we'll, we'll have a conversation. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm definitely, I definitely had you on mind as far as like people that I was connected with and reaching out when I was ready to make a flight, take a trip that I was going to reach out. You are one of the people that I was going to reach out. That's what's up, man. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely would like to, I, I enjoy your stuff online, but I definitely want to hear the live version big time. And also just your work ethic you know what I mean? Because we've collaborated before. You know what I mean? It's something that I always wanted to do. So it's all good. Uh, how can pe- how can people reach out to you and, and follow and get one of these singles? I'm gonna have the information anyway after after we fade to black. You know what I mean? But just to let people know um, how to how to catch up with you, shout shout it out, please. So I got a I got a website. It's www pastthelight.com P-A-S-S-D-A not T-H-E but Pass the Light okay gotcha yeah so the I mean T-H-E was taken when I was trying to get the uh, you know the um, domain name so I had to be a little creative with that so I definitely want I like that phrase I was using that phrase early on like passing the light from me to the listeners so I was like I need that for my domain name but it was the was taken, so I had to go past the light. Got you, got you. Okay, so that's All the right. website, and then um, Instagram. I'm on Instagram a lot these days, so at Kilowatt Poet. I don't stuff. tweet as much, but that's where we we had our first interaction on Twitter. That's right, that's right. And then we kind of went over to Instagram. We set this up through Instagram, but the my, yeah. our first interactions was through through. Through um through Twitter, I don't know yep. who followed who first. To be honest with you, but uh, one sure, day I just bro. saw you on the timeline. I was just rocking with you. Yeah, for sure. And so it's at Kilowatt Poet on Twitter. Right. Know, I don't tweet as much, but I still got some archives on there. Gotcha. And Facebook, I got a uh, Facebook page. It's Mister Enlightenment. If you search Mister Enlightenment, you'll find the Facebook fan page. We find this latest single because I want to hear it. You know what I mean? Is right, it on so, Spotify? Is it on? Yeah, it's on Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music. It's called That's Let Them Words up. Play. That's what's up. It's called, okay. it's called Let Them Words Play. All right. All right. Lady, like, we, we will wrap up another one. Thank you for being the first guest on the Adventures of a Naive Poet. Um, I've known you digitally for a long, long time. I'm going to be on the East Coast doing a showcase. I don't know how much you travel up and down the East Coast. Um, I'm going to be doing a showcase on June the 12th, uh, June the 11th, excuse me, a Saturday of this year in East New York in Harlem. Um, one of the biggest shows I've done in New York um, called The Poet and the Violin. It's going to be myself and a violinist by the name of Brooke Alford, artist of the violin out of Atlanta. She is an absolute monster. Yeah, so, the violin. The violin is underrated because I did a a poem with a violinist, and it was it was a cool experience. I think I saw the footage. I think did you put that on the gram? Yeah, I got that. I, on there. I believe I saw that. That was freaking dope. So I'm gonna be up there in June. Um, you are welcome to come up. You know, what I mean, you're welcome to speak if you want to. If you, if you want to come up. You know, I mean, it's June the 11th. I'll let you know the details as I know them. You know, I mean, because the team is still putting it together, but everybody's pretty much locked in. Yeah, I definitely want to travel outside of my region here. That's been a goal for a while. Come to NY, my friend. It would be it would be great to have you. It'd be great to break bread in any in any regards. And also, I want to introduce you to the collective that I work with, the team that I work with. And they're always uh, looking for talented brothers like yourself, you know what I mean, to solidify and connect with because they always have a revolving door of these projects that they always got cooking that need writers, 
that need performers, that need all of that stuff like that. So I would love to welcome you into the circle, okay? Um, if you're available, uh, that will be Saturday, June 11th of 2022. And the show is going to be dope. Um, I'm writing the show as we speak, you know what I mean? And I really want to... I'm really trying to take the spoken word arts to another tier, you know, so that's me, you know, and, and violinist, I actually got, I actually got a ringer. Brooke, the violin chick is my ringer. You know what I mean? She's so daggone amazing. You know what I mean? You just can't miss, you know what I mean? It's like having, it's like having Shaq on your team in the nineties. It's like, we got Shaq, you know what I mean? Who you got? We got Shaq. So anyway, Thanks for the interview, bro. Appreciate you. Um, I'll have this up and running before you know it. And I'll talk to you next time. All right, man. Appreciate the love and the uh, opportunity to come on your platform. I see you doing a lot of things, man. Keep up the work. You're putting in a lot of work right here. So keep pushing it for the culture. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Don't go. But to everybody else, I say peace.